Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Crowdcast event with Susie Gilbert and Kim Doner. We are here to talk about all things wildlife rehabilitation, writing, and so much more with these wonderful female authors who also like to rescue animals. So 15 years ago, Susie Gilbert and Kim Doner met in an online forum for licensed caregivers of injured and orphaned wildlife. And so it turned out though, they were both also writers and had a lot in common. So they stayed in touch, swapped some stories about their lives and their works. And that is the great thing about living in this day and age is that technology allows us to stay connected across such great distances. And it also allows us now as a library to put on events like this. So before I formally introduce both of our guests here tonight, who you can see smiling on screen with me, give a wave. Um, I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about how this is gonna operate. Uh, you can see on your screen, there is a, a place where you can ask a question. So as we're talking, um, if you want to have a question come up at the end, I'm gonna come back and moderate the questions. Just pop your questions in there. You can also go to see what other people have asked and vote out their questions so we can see what the most popular questions are. And yes, we're gonna have a special guest at the end from Kim, so stay on for that. And I think we're also gonna try and invite uh, Geraldine on with Ruby. And we don't know who Ruby quite is, it's the mystery guest from Ruby. Well, I think some of us might know. So we're gonna do a lot of that. And so yes, technology makes it possible that we can all come here on Crowdcast. We have a little chat box open right now, and I love that there's so much chat going on but i am going to turn that chat off just for the main part of the event and then i'll bring it up back during the question period so we can all focus on the conversation that will happen between uh kim and susie so susie gilbert lives in new york's hudson valley and um the impetus for this event is that i had a message from a friend of hers i know from princeton um uh, jessica Pauline, who works for uh, who worked for the Princeton University Press and is a publisher and publicist, I should say, a publicist. And uh, Jessica introduced me to Susie and her wonderful book, Unflappable, as she was helping to promote it. And so um, I knew this was going to be a great book for us to have on as this type of event. So uh, prior to doing this debut novel, um, Susie also wrote a memoir, Fly Away. Uh, how a wild bird rehabber sought adventure, and also a children's book, Hawk Hill. And so, as I said, she and uh, her moderator guest here, Kim Doner, met many years ago online, 15 years ago. So now, as I said, technology is wonderful because uh, Susie's in H New York, Hudson Valley, and Kim is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, far away. Uh, but they are good friends. And um, so, Kim is the author and our illustrator of over a dozen award-winning children's books, including Buffalo Dreams and On a Road in Africa. And she's also illustrated novellas for PC Cast YA series, House of Night. And she is very involved in rehab in the Tulsa, Oklahoma area in many ways um, and taking care of animals of all sorts by the sounds of it. So that's what I'm my introduction to these wonderful guests. So I'm going to kind of just get them going here to just to talk a little bit about how they've managed to combine these two very, you know, different type of interests, like to find two people who are really that deeply into writing books and illustrating and novels and who are also deeply into the world of wildlife rehab is quite unique. So it's really great that you were able to connect. So can you just talk about how you combine those two aspects of your lives? Oh. We can do that. <laughs> Are you ready for it? <laughs> oh yeah, it's a juggling. Great. Well, I was going to start with with Susie as to the name. Oh, I love the name Unflappable. That's a wonderful, wonderful title. And whatever inspired you to get started on that? There you go. There you go. <laughs> How'd you get started? How did I get started? Well, um, I was working on another project. And uh, I was talking to my agent and uh, while we were talking, he, uh, I said, I told him a, a wildlife story. A friend of, a rehabber friend of mine had told me a story about rescuing an owl and it was very dramatic and it was really funny too. And I told him this story and he said, he said, if I were a movie producer, I'd be all over that. Why don't you write it as a novel? And I said, because I don't know how to write a novel. And he said, read Carl Hyacinth. 
And then he left me with that. <laughs> so um, I did. And uh, Carl Hyacin was a, he was a good teacher. And people say that this book, if you like Carl Hyacin, it's that type of book. It's, it you know, it's funny. It's fast paced. It is a little, it's a little darker and, um, you know, not as madcap as Carl Heisen, but it's the, it's the idea. I, I, I would kind of disagree with you a little bit on it not being as madcap as his. <laughs> really? You've spent all these years as a rehabber. So you yeah. are well aware and are, are adjusted to what it's like to do that. And so as I, and, and I, I am too, I, you know, but yeah, when you start describing the characters where your where Luna, who is for, for those who haven't read this wonderful book yet and who are currently already downloading it or anything like that, <laughs> the character is Luna, Luna Burke. And I can give you the quick I can give you the quick okay, synopsis. Do do so, there, so there's a girl and a guy, and they're in a 57 Chevy, and they've got a stolen eagle in the back seat, and they're heading for Canada, and everybody and their brother is after them. Well, I am going to say That's something funny. real quick. She is a heroine. <laughs> She's not an eagle stealer. <laughs> she is. It's, she did not steal the eagle. This is a stolen, stolen eagle. Right. And her mission for that eagle is? She is taking the eagle to out of a private zoo where the bird does not belong and right. up to Canada to an eagle sanctuary. And on the way, she needs to, re to reunite this eagle with its mate. So... Right. This there. eagle has been bird napped. Yeah. And she's reuniting everyone. So she is. She she and she's being chased by everything under the sun. She's being chased by her soon to be ex husband, his bodyguards, the police, conservation officials, a fish and wildlife government tracker, and everyone's after her. But the way she gets out is there's an underground railroad of wildlife rehabilitators. And yes. so she goes, because, you know, this is a, it's a full grown bald eagle. You can't just stick him in the trunk. You right. need to have a place for him. Hard to be and, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> and the other thing is the eagle, um, the eagle is, does not like men. He's homicidal. And Luna's getaway driver is afraid of birds. Mm -hmm. So when you say it's madcap, I guess it does get pretty madcap. <laughs> <laughs> they're turning vehicles, they're bunking in, and and the bird yeah. in a flight cage tries to attack our hero, and you know that doesn't get him past that fear much, but it certainly gives him respect, I would say. So he has to learn to overcome these kinds of things. Don't we all? Don't we all? Yes, no don't we all? Is, you know, it's I think of this as learning curve, learning curve when you're rehabbing, and and everyone starts yeah. off with da da yeah. and. I'm going to be Snow White, and what exactly? How did you get into rehabbing? How did you end up doing that? How did I get into it? Yeah. Um, so I moved from New York City to the Hudson Valley, and I, I had always been into animals. Um, I did lots of rescue. I did horse rescue. I did dog rescue. I did parrot rescue. And when I was in my parrot stage, someone said, "Oh, you like birds? Go up to the Hudson Valley Raptor Center," and it was a it was a center just for birds of prey. And I fell madly in love with these beautiful, lethal birds. And I worked there for 11 years. So that's wow. how. And, you and how about you? Oh, with me? What? How did uh, well, you get it? Most of the, I've always been an animal person with the Snow White complex. And, you know, my little dream was that I would get to be like Snow White. I wasn't that interested in marrying the prince. I, the huntsman might have done okay, but. <laughs> Um, and, you know, it was that buying into a fantasy. And then one day I was hearing these thumping sounds in the walls between my bedroom and bathroom. And I realized that somehow a bird had gotten into the attic, had babies, and they'd gotten big enough to tump the nest over and they'd fallen down between the walls. So uh -huh. choices, you either, you know, cut holes in the wall to get them out. And, you know, there you go with birds in your hand or you let them die. And so after, you know, Home Depot, new credit card and cutting holes in the wall and everything, <laughs> I'm standing there, little birds in my hand. What now I what do I do? do? 
And I called my vet who I'd gone to high school with, Paul Welch, yeah. and said, I'm holding three little birds. Um, he goes, congratulations, you're a mother. And it was like, no, I don't know <laughs> what to do. And so no, you kind of learn. Everyone I know starts off by the seat of their pants, but they live. Yeah. That was the biggie. They lived. And yeah. I, thought, well, I could help a little bit here and there. <laughs> Sorry, <Yeah>. hysterical laughter. <laughs> A little bit <laughs> here and there. <laughs> because it snowballs. It's it a it's it's just a ball rolling down a hill. This is what happened to me too, is I I opened my own place eventually and I said, yeah. I am only going to take small birds, only birds that are have recovered. I'm no babies, no injuries, no big birds. That lasted five minutes. Yeah. You, you know, you you put rules together when you're a rehabber and they last five minutes. That's just if you're lucky. <laughs> if you're lucky, I know. If you're really stalwart. <laughs> well, I just, I, I am so enjoying, I'm not quite done with the book, so don't tell me the ending, but I am so enjoying all your research. I mean, I am just amazed at how much you know and say, use properly, you know, references to animal problems. Uh, the guy, the our Panther King, who's the, the rehabber who takes the Florida Panther and is, you know, working for them and his gun collection yeah. and he knows his guns. <laughs> it's like, whoa. There, there's out. lots of guns in this book. Yes. <laughs> there's well, guns and classic cars. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, I mean, yeah. I, I would not be surprised for Carl Hyacin to say something somewhere about this because. He well, you know, come on, Carl. Yeah, really. But this is this is another point is where every place she stops, the rehabbers do a different type of animal. So yes. some of them do birds, some of them do mammals, some of them do reptiles. And you get to you get to have a little window into what different rehabbers do for different species. And all of them, you know, they're all so cool and interesting. And oh, and I'm know, hoping that people who even that. sorry. It's it's sort um, of like each chapter where she's she's stopping, you get a, a bird's eye view, ha ha ha. But you you get just a tiny slice of what what people go through to save animals and to certainly restore them back to the wild and and yeah. the caretaking, the kinds of pins or or flight cages, everything that you need, the fact that sometimes they will need medication, you need to work with vets, you need to work with community it's you really cover that nicely so people will go whoa i didn't know there was all this much involved so I, I uh, and you know a lot of the research i did consisted of calling up my rehabber friends and saying what kind of setup do you need for a black bear you know because i i have kim and i both have friends all over the country and we're all connected by these listservs and by our emails and if we have a question on any kind of animal, you can get on and call call people and uh, ask the question, and they will know. Yeah. Yeah. Some, somebody out there, someone has had this before. When you realize yes. that it's all one big learning curve, and you will never yeah. achieve knowing everything about every animal. The, the yeah. biggest surprise is, and I love how you gave personality to your eagle, to Mars, and how he prefers women yeah. and doesn't like guys and he recognizes them and people often think of oh that's just a fill in the blank oh that's just they're they're just crows right they're just raccoons they don't right. realize all the animals have as many personalities as we do so yeah they, every single one mm -hmm. i you know all the birds that i've ever had in they're all everyone has a different personality and, you know, usually it turns out, you know, if you have an eagle that doesn't like men, it's for a reason. And, the, you know, the backstory of this eagle is he was taken illegally from a nest when he was young and raised in captivity, captivity by someone who treated him badly. Mm -hmm. So, of course, he would be not sure. happy. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, any animal that's mistreated by, but it's interesting, yeah. though that animals pick up on what sex someone is. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's been intriguing to me and they do. They really, you know, um we'll have dogs that curl up in someone's lap and it's if it's a small person they they go with size, 
but they'll off and they'll also transfer if someone had blonde hair and was unkind to them and someone else yeah. with blonde hair comes in they'll do that too right right so it's it's always interested me how it they manifest people wouldn't believe it but squirrels i mean you'll have four baby squirrels and one of them's a piglet and one of them is kind of picky and <laughs> one of them jumps on your face and that's why you run around with little bitty scabs all over and you scream every time you take a shower during the summer because you know it, ah, i didn't know they got me again <laughs> so, anyway. hey you're discouraging people here oh no 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 it's, it's amazing oh no that doesn't happen that never, never. happens. <laughs> These scars. That She's was making it up. Bicycle riding. <laughs> That's right. Oh man. Well, so. when you got this started, do you do you remember like starting your first words? It, it was a dark and stormy night. No, uh, but it was a dark and stormy night. You know, this book went through four different drafts because oh. you know, as I said, I had no idea how to write a novel. And luckily, I had this wonderful, I have this wonderful agent, Russell Galen, and um, I would write a draft and I would send it to him thinking it was done. And he'd write me back and he'd tell me all the good things that were going on with it. And then he'd say, but this doesn't work and this doesn't work and this doesn't work. And he'd send me back to the drawing board. And I did this, you know, three completely different drafts where like... I was just, I threw everything. The kitchen sink was in there. I mean, I had the heroine taking over Wall Street at one time. I, I just <laughs> had no idea what I was doing. And finally, you know, the fourth draft, I thought, he's going to hate this. You know, I'm going to have to go back to the drawing board. He's not going to like it at all. And he loved it. So that shows that I should not be an agent. <laughs> but, you know, the the plot of this book is so convoluted there's you know there are so many different characters and they are all heading north but in a kind of serpentine way they kind of have contact with each other and then they don't and i tried to keep track of it on my computer and there was just no way i think if i were a millennial i could do it but i'm just not in that age group anymore i'm trying to figure out like how to do this and I ended up getting sticky notes and I put however many chapters I had, I can't even, like 34 chapters, and I put chapters on sticky notes all the way across one wall. And then that was the horizontal. And then vertically, I'd have each event and the character who was in the event had a different color ink. So I could keep track of everything, but I had this massive wall of sticky notes trying to figure out where people were going. But it worked at the end. I mean, a mm -hmm. lot of it different is. rearranging. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that that's, that's brilliant. I mean, how, the, to stand there and to be able to go across the wall and down and across and down and, 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 and then bring it back together, is, it's very three-dimensional. You had to think three-dimensionally for that. Yeah. And it shows because you it's not a convoluted plot. I mean, there are lots of characters, there's lots of stuff happening. And the fun yeah. thing about the book is it's not although it you can't put it in a genre that much, although there's definitely an adventure there and yeah. you know, it's still educational. It still makes a wonderful point on a meta level, and there's still romance and there's playfulness and, and a whole lot of smart aleckness. But uh, yeah. it's Narkery. There you go. But there's there is it has an androgynous appeal for people who have yeah. strong personalities with a lot who like strong personalities. It it's not a chick kind of book. It's yeah. not a manly man book. But there's there's enough testosterone throughout this that anybody <laughs> is going to enjoy it. Any adult who has any interest in adventure and animals is going to be like. This is so fun. This is so cool. It, well, thank you, Kim. <laughs> That's you really go. nice. But, you know, it's funny, uh, too. Uh, if you, you remember this, uh, did you see Romancing the Stone? I did, you know, years ago. Years ago. I remembered loving it. I, well, the, the, I, I, it's one of those, one of the few that I like watching it again and again, especially for the beginning. 
because Kathleen Turner narrates the scenes as she as an author is imagining them happening. And you know, right. it, it's the, and, and she kills the bad guy and you know that's the end of him, the one who you know, burned my ranch, shot my daddy and stole my Bible, you know. And then she, <laughs> and she attaches herself to Jesse, the love of her life, and they ride off in the sunset. And then you see the flash right. over to Kathleen Turner. And she's puffy eyed, no makeup, rotten hair, crying, and she's run out of toilet paper and paper towels and everything else. And, and you know, and, 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 but she's crying at her own ending. Yeah. Did you scene in this book get you choked up? Were you like, the <laughs> This is so good. Or, oh, I remember this. It broke my heart. Oh, all of the above. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I, this is what happened. You know, whenever I write books, this is that there are parts that make me cry. And there are parts that make, you know, I, I'm writing something and I crack myself up. And then I think, God, I wonder if anybody else in the world is going to think this is funny. They're probably going to go, what is she talking about? This isn't funny. But I think it's funny. And I, I remember um, when I was writing my memoir, Fly Away, which was, you know, all about me uh, trying to raise two kids and run a wild bird hospital out of my house at the same time. Um, when I when I finally got around to writing the book, I would sit at the kitchen table and I had all my intake records from every time a bird comes in to a rehabber, uh, you have to you have to have the name of the person who who brought him. You have to have the address. You have to have what kind of bird. What is the injuries? I mean, just exhaustive records. And and I had these records. And so when I was writing my memoir, I would go through all these records and I would remember the bird stories. And then I would, you know, write them up. And my kids would walk up the hill home from school and they'd get off the school bus and they'd come into the house and they'd see me at the kitchen table typing and just weeping. And they'd, they'd say, what's wrong? What happened? And I'd say, oh, it was, remember that little, remember that little sparrow that came in? And they'd say, but that was five years ago. You know? And I'd be, I'd be crying. So, you know, I think if you get into, you get into what you're writing, it's going to affect you or you're not going to write convincingly about it. Do you find that? Oh, I do. Absolutely. Every, every time I, uh, <clears throat> there, I uh, did Buffalo Dreams, and if I read it out yeah. loud, I get choky at a point, when, and I have to slow down and make myself focus on, on reading it aloud for kids, because, yeah. you know, it's me, and it's like, I'm like Kathleen Turner. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and then. Tell, on, on tell the, the synopsis after, of that, of, 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 Buffalo, of Buffalo Dreams, Dreams, what it's about. Well, that yeah. was that was inspired by me reading. For, I I've been working with Council Oak Books. They were doing a series of Native American picture books, of which there were very very few. And I had illustrated two for them. And I was reading a People magazine, thinking, you know, I need I I would like to start writing more. I want to do this more. And I hadn't been published as an author. And I came across a photograph of a baby white buffalo born up in Janesville, Wisconsin, named Miracle. And I thought, oh, I remember all the buffalo stories. Oh, my gosh. And I started reading about it. And in my mind, you know, they're supposed to be very magical creatures and signs of good things to come. And I started thinking, wow, but she's just so cute because I'm a very touchy-feely sort, you know. And, and I thought, I love yeah. Love pet baby buffalo, and I started thinking how woolly the fur would feel, and those great big uh -huh. dark eyes, and, and yeah. it started surfacing. And that's, and I bet you've done that too. You you just kind of feel something knocking on the door at the back yeah. of your mind, and yeah. I kind of opened the door because I have I have tons of ideas all the time, but this started taking hold. And I started uh, two sides of me. One was the little kid that's unrealistic and I want to go touch a magic animal. And then it was an older child of me who thought, yeah, that would be really wonderful, but we need to be respectful of that and, and respectful of the culture. Yeah. And, and the book started to grow. So at, towards the end of it, though, there's a realization 
where a little girl says, magic doesn't make you do something special. You do something special and it makes magic. And oh. that just came out. I, I didn't yeah. know it was in my brain. And yeah. I, realized, well, I really kind of believe that. <laughs> so that, that became the core of the book for me. And a- as I'm enjoying the things that you do, like I've read all your other books too and love all your stories. And I'm going to hold one up real quick. That is very hard to find these days, but it is uh, definitely very touching. This is Hawk Hill. Oh, thank you, Kim. So beautiful. And I <laughs> love this story. Tell, tell folks who aren't, who maybe aren't going to be able to find the book, tell them a little bit about how you got started with that. Uh, I wrote that book when I was working at the Raptor Center. And, you know, I can't even remember why I wrote a children's book because I didn't have kids at the time. And no. And again, I didn't know what I was doing. And so uh, I just, I wrote this story and I, I didn't have an agent. I just, I thought, well, I'll just send it off to publishers. And I sent it to 52 publishers because the story, the story was about a boy who moves to a new town and he doesn't have any friends. And uh, he stumbles upon a woman, a, an older woman who rehabs birds of prey. She has a small place in her home. And it's about the friendship that grows between these two. And you learn about birds of prey. And um, the publishers I sent it to, you know, a good number of them said, if you would just just follow the regular format and shorten it, because it was it was a it's a fairly long book and it uses, you know, it adult, I mean, if I say adult language, it sounds like they're all cursing at each other. But you know, it's not it's not really written for young children. It's right. written for older children. Right. And uh, they said, if you, if you turn it into a regular one, we would take it. But I thought that would destroy the story. Mm-hmm. So I just kept sending it around and the 53rd publisher bought it wow. and um, made a beautiful, they made a beautiful book. They, they uh, introduced me to a, an illustrator in um, Arizona and she has these beautiful beautiful illustrations. Did you get to meet your illustrator first or after they decided or how? I've never met her. I've talked to her on the phone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like rehabbers, you know, Mm -hmm. I I mean, most of my rehabber friends, I've, I've never met in person. We're all good friends over the internet. And Sylvia Long, the illustrator and I are friends on the internet or by phone, but I haven't, I haven't met her. We're actually trying to get the rights back for that book so we can publish it again. Oh, I hope yeah. you do. Oh, well, you know, wish you us do. luck. It's in the system. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, the system. This is something a lot of people have no clue about. They, oh, the I, system. Have you had people approach you and say, I've got a good story for you to write and I'm going to let you write it and then we can split the money? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've had That's that. right. I've had, you do I've all had, the work and I'll get yeah. half the money. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll give you the idea. And you want to say, really? Right. Uh, ideas are like blades of grass and I've got plenty in my front yard. And yeah. that's not meant to be unkind. It's that so, so many people but, want you to do, it's like the little red hen. Go a little red hen me and I'll eat the bread at the end. And it's like, anymore, <laughs> I'd say, no, do some home. Yeah. Work. But, you know, writing is hard. It's, it it's is. hard. Like, it's hard. Not- it, it, if even at your most inspired, let's say you, you're going, oh, tappity tap tap, and you're just writing all day long, and you, you yeah. struggle around four hours, and you, you hit, I don't know, you know 3,000 words, something like that, and you walk away, and you turn around, and nothing has changed. Your laundry is not done. Your groceries were not purchased. Your, your bills weren't written and yeah. you, you, know, yeah. you, you close down the computer and there's nothing to show yeah. for it. So it's, <laughs> that's like, right. <laughs> right yeah. And then sometimes, you know, you put all this effort into it and you finish something and then they say, ah, uh, you know, uh, mm, can you, can you make it into a murder mystery? <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what you do. Somebody's not going to like it. It's like being an actor. You have to go through a lot of rejection. It is. Well, and illustrator is the same way. It's you. I, I kind of compare all of it to deciding you're going to mine yourself for gold and you will get your pickaxe and you'll put your little helmet on and turn on your light and you got yeah. a bucket and you start digging it out of yourself and you sift through the bucket and you get deeper and deeper and you're hoping you'll find gold and at the end of a long long time you might have something after all that time sifting through and you got a whole lot of rocks and dirt <laughs> lots <laughs> well i don't know how you do it because you not only write but create all kinds of art i mean i have met few people who are as prolific in so many different creative ways as you so go ahead tell us how you do it oh, no, I, I'm, <laughs> I, I think i might be adhd a little bit but i'm oh. circular in that i loop and so instead of spiraling off i spiral and then spiral back like a boomerang with things but okay. um i'm I, I, I don't feel like I do it. I feel like I'm a jack of all trades more because I'll get going on something for a number of years and I, I've, got, I've got a story I've been working on for several years. I've got artwork in my mind and setting aside the time to start teasing it out is like yeah. starting an exercise program. And it's a matter yeah. of building muscles. And yeah. you might get to where you're running five miles several days a week and suddenly someone says, but you need to be doing a Zumba class. And you understand <laughs> the process of building yeah. up the, the, the self-discipline and you know what it's like to train your muscles or your brain. And then you have to switch and that shift is so hard. But, yeah. it's, um, you know, I do, I do like to do a little bit of everything. And I kind of think of my studio as like a, an adult playpen. There's something in every corner that I'm addressing at one time or another. <laughs> That's good to have. Then you don't get bored with one thing. No, I don't. I don't get bored. I'm not a yeah. get bored person. Mainly yeah. because I have no shame, and I entertain myself <laughs> with all sorts of things. <laughs> but okay, one thing. One thing I know a lot of people are going to want to hear from you, though, and and pr you probably haven't had time to think about this. When I met uh -oh. you. I begging for help with crows. And if you recall, I, I wrote you right. a, and, and I'd already, I was already in awe of Susie Gilbert, but I wrote you an email and I said, you know, what do I do with this guy? Help me, Obi-Wan Kanuzi. You're my only friend. <laughs> <laughs> and, and immediately I was your best friend because I thought that yeah. was so funny. <laughs> and I think it had to do with, you know, I think you had to get maggots out of crows or something of, of which yeah. I'm an expert. I know how to do that. And, well, and yeah, and it was just, you know, this recipe you do. And, uh, and, I've, and I, after my, uh, after fly away came out, I remember, um, Kim's, Kim's rehab place called wing it. This is yeah. wing it in Tulsa. Right. Mm -hmm. So they were having a, uh, a, uh, uh, fundraiser. And Kim said, I need to get you out to Tulsa so that you can speak at our fundraiser and you can sell your books and you can, you know, do all this. And I said, well, you know, if you can do it. And I didn't realize that, uh, I didn't realize what Kim was truly like at that point. And not only did she find someone to buy me a ticket to Tulsa and back, but the second I hit the ground, she had me speaking at schools, at, you know, other nonprofits. She had me at the Grace No Eagle Sanctuary. She had, I, I, and the fundraiser was this amazing, just, I, I've never seen anyone multitask like this, which is why I call her Whirlwind Kim. It's <laughs> WWK. And during this entire process where there was so much going on with all, you know, trying to get a fundraiser going for wildlife and, and book sales and all this, Kim is making toffee and not just like a plate of toffee to sell at the fundraiser. 
she was making like 200 pounds of toffee. I've never seen such a production in my life. You practically had guys with shovels with the sugar. I mean, it was the most delicious toffee I have ever oh, tasted, thanks. but whirlwind Kim. Yeah. My, my friends, my friends, when I, 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 at this point, I'm doing this commercially on a small venture here in Tulsa, uh, the um, mostly magic kitchen, mostly. And yeah. uh, I, I kind of laugh because I do it for fundraising for wing it. And when we aren't doing a fundraiser, I sell it commercially and contribute back to women in recovery, which is a fabulous program here in Tulsa. And they let me use their kitchen. And that's, that's our exchange. It's really, they're just great. And I remember sitting down with them when I was first starting and saying, okay, health department, getting my licenses, this, this, and this. And, and they said, well, what are you calling your pro product? And I said, well, all my friends call it crack. And then I realized <laughs> that's not going to work. On, no. on a commercial basis. <laughs> so it becomes Not a, the disappearing toffee. And the whole deal is you buy it, you put it on a plate, and it's the best magic trick in a book because it disappears every time. It so, was very but good. Thank, thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> I've forgotten I'd made it when you were there too. But yeah, that was so much fun to, to have you out. And one story you told that stuck with me was that you had released soft released crows who had made crow friends and they came and hung out with you all the time and you would jog and they would go from one tree to the next to the next following you along your jogging right 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 it was yeah. amazing um crows when you uh when you raise crows you well any bird you sh you can't raise them alone or they will imprint and so you have to get on the phone and call all your rehabber friends and say, do you have any crows? You know, do you have any bluebirds? Do you have any? And it's, it's like this game of going back and forth. But um, yes, I would release all my crows eventually. And then they would, um, they would stay around the house. And there are two of them. One in particular would come, would come running with us and come to the pond with us. When my kids were growing up, we had a giant, black curly coated retriever 120 pounds and the dog and the crow and the kids and I would go off and off into the woods it was it was really great but things like that you know that's that's the kind of thing that you write about you know those kinds of experiences you you know they're they're such rich material for for writing and um you know it it it's it's great it is. It's, it's such great fodder. And one yeah. thing people have asked me a lot is, you know, how you got into to writing or whatever, and how do I do yeah. this? And they actually think that a story starts when you sit down in front of a typewriter or in front oh. of a keyboard. And, and it's like, yeah. no, that's, that's when, that's way on down the line. A story starts is when you get out and live a full life and you take yeah. risks and you have experiences and you, you know, you, you go from dances with wolves to jogs with crows. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I remember the first time I started writing little environmental stories was actually for the Hudson Valley Raptor Center's newsletter. Um, they didn't have a newsletter before I started working there. And the, uh, the founder and I, you know, had this idea that we should do a fundraising newsletter. And the thing is, you know, just like what you were saying, every bird that comes in has their own story mm -hmm. and it's there, you know, it's such a compelling thing to, um, you know, to tell what happened to them, you know, what, what got in their way, what it normally, you know, 95% of wildlife injuries are from human causes. And so, you could say what what kind of bird it was, how they came in, what was their injury, how can you not, you know, how can you prevent that from happening again? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I started writing the newsletter, I would write these little stories and they were only, you know, a couple paragraphs for each one, but it was a complete story. Mm -hmm. And I just realized that that with a little story like that, you could you could make people feel warm and fuzzy. You could make them make them laugh you could tear their hearts out 
and then they would reach for their wallets and give you money for your birds. <laughs> oh, one other thing, I will. I should have had it for me instead of my birds. <laughs> You're talking about giving money. Um, my first raccoon release was done for a friend, and it. And I'm seeing. Is this time for question and answer? Yeah, we... but that's okay. Go ahead. Hi, Janie. Oh, I, I was just going to mention because um, I, this is this was compiled in Oklahoma. This is one of our attempts in, in here, Love Can Be. Mm -hmm. and I have oh. a story in that that is Great book. comic relief. <laughs> you have such a good story in that book. And it, it was helping out other rehabbers, which we often do. And it had to do with taking raccoons that were mature enough to be released in the woods and driving towards these woods, which was about an hour away, going, you know, 65 miles an hour in a Friday afternoon traffic thunderstorm on an expressway, and a raccoon got loose in my car. <laughs> so that's, yes. You have to buy the book to find out what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, obviously I lived. That's, that's all I will tell you. But you did bottom line, I just, I am so excited to be here, and I will turn over all our questions and stuff. But Susie, thank you so much. And thank you for Unflappable. It, I hope it is. Oh. The, the freedom, the thread of freedom that you share throughout that and what it means to all of us is so wonderful. And, and I, hope, I hope a bazillion people will buy it and give it as gifts and enjoy it as thoroughly <laughs> as I have. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Yes, I agree. And I, I mean, one of the things I connected with in Unflappable is of course is that they're trying to escape to Canada. Um, I'm a I, I'm a Canadian. I'm like I, I think I don't think I told uh, you and Kim that when we were in yeah. the green room. So yes, no, I'm a Canadian, and so anybody heading to towards Canada, that's going to tug at my heart. Um, it's a great destination, and I kind of wish I was there right now. But anyhow, um, don't so line. get in line. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm Geraldine and Ruby, and as I said. Kim, you have a special guest to bring on for us as well. Is that not correct? I let's do. get would Kim's like special guest. guest. Would you like our guest right now? Yeah, let's okay. bring on the special guest. Give me a moment. Sometimes he wants to come and not. <gasps> oh, yeah. who is this? And can you tell us? He came in today and has already eaten an entire mouse. Does not like me a bit. He's got his head turned away from me somewhat. But here we go. This is no. coming. The hawks, are you almost, we're getting lots of barred owls. We've gotten lots of great horned owls. And now we're getting our red tail and red shoulder hawks coming in. And after that, in a few months, we'll be seeing kestrels and Mississippi kites. But with all the shift in our climate, we're not real sure how much of what we're going to get in. It has been a flood of animals. And yeah. this little guy is going to go to join Fine. maybe eight or nine others. He's in good shape. Let me see if I can hold him up a little bit more. You can see that. that Look at him. He's so pretty. <laughs> he neat? He's a little fuzz buzz right now. But Wait a minute. I've lost good. you guys. I beg your pardon? I've lost your images. Is everybody else still seeing their images? I can see you. Hmm. I can see you. Might be my connection is a little bit slow. Okay. Okay. Is everybody else still seeing? Okay. Great. So why now? Why this bird is looking very docile? Why can this little guy not fly? Oh, uh, well, he's a baby. You can. He's see a baby. Little bits of fuzz tufts here. He probably had an older sibling that was bigger, hatched a few days ahead, and birds grow super, super fast. Oh. And the sibling most likely pushed him out of the nest, which happens. They they are very enthusiastic. They give each other the elbow. Beg your pardon? They give they, each other the elbow. Yes, they do. And uh, a lot of people think they want a pet raptor. Oh, that'd be so cool. And they'll get hold of these kids and they will feed them hamburger going, oh, they love meat. And after less than 72 hours, that is a death sentence for a raptor because mm -hmm. the babies need so much more calcium and there's not calcium in meat, there's protein. So they need bones. And that's why we feed them frozen mice. And a lot of people 
do not want to yeah. bother with that. And that's how rehabbers end up having to euthanize animals. It's heartbreaking. It is infuriating. So I'm very grateful mm. that people contacted Wing It and said, what do we do? And we said, take it to the vet. They'll do a quick exam to check for breaks. And then we pick it up yeah. and start on the proper diet for the birds. Do we need questions anywhere? Okay, so yeah. now I'm in questions. Uh, yeah, hang on. I've got three questions coming up, but I've also invited Geraldine online because she said she's here with Ruby, and I think we all want to meet Ruby. We do. Where's Ruby? I think we do. So let's see if we can get Ruby up here while we're at it. Um, while you're waiting, I'm going to apologize if anyone's seen me suddenly move oddly. It's oh, there's Ruby. I, oh, I <laughs> <laughs> Look at Hi, Geraldine. Ruby's not so sure about those birds of prey. No. Yeah. No. So tell us about Ruby. Well, Ruby's a Con Congo African Gray, and he's 16 years old. <laughs> he's clucking like a chicken right now. Uh, I've had Ruby since he was uh, two, and we were his fourth home. So. Oh. Hmm. Now he has a good home. Yes. Yes, he does. But uh, Susie, it, it should be noted, is... Uh, in my addendum to my will as his guardian. So if something happens to me, <laughs> Susie will be on the case, finding Ruby a wonderful home. Oh, I can't hide. She moved yeah. to Texas. She's well, how, long, how, long, how long will um, Ruby live? Well, Ruby could live for 60 or 65 years, and he's 16 now. Forever. Yeah, forever. <sighs> yeah. Forever. I didn't know that they lived that long. Yeah, yeah. And they're very, very Those smart birds. Those big ones in Florida, the big, huge macaws, can live to be 100. But oh usually they don't. People don't take good enough care of them. But they can yeah. live a long time. So how much of your bird rescue then is for, like, domestic birds versus um, wild birds? I'm, I'm sorry, are you talking to me? I didn't. I didn't anybody. Um, oh. Uh-oh, we're there. scrambling. Yeah, we're, we're hearing everybody. I, I'll, I'll interject it and keep it quiet for a second. The uh, wild birds usually have such hard lives that they don't live all that long. But blue jays can live up to like 15 years, and there's actually a documented yeah. crow that was 49 years old, I believe. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if things are cared for and pampered well and given the proper nutrition and exercise and everything else, then you end up with something gorgeous like ruby well into the next two or three generations of people. Ruby looks really good. Does he? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to thank Ruby for being on screen with us. And so we're going to go back nice to the Q&A. Thank, thank you, Ruby. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Um, good to see you, Bye. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. Let me just... There we go. Okay. Ruby. That was fun. Yeah, yeah why we're we getting a little bit of feedback. Um, it seems when I'm talking, you might go home. Okay, Do, is, um, has somebody maybe accidentally opened up two windows? That's usually what happens when there's feedback. You know? Okay, so what first, sound, you still have me on sound, I think. This is Geraldine. Oh, is there a, okay? Is there a mute on your screen, Geraldine? Uh, yeah. Um, that better? Let me do this. Oops, I can remove you. Whoopsie. Okay. There we go. I think that'll be better now, right? Yes. Okay, great. So the first question um, is, the first person they want to know is, do women make better rehabbers than men in general? Um, <laughs> it says, and they also have kind of tongue in cheek. Um, we know that they're better humans. <laughs> <laughs> which is not fair come on now but yes uh but in general do you think that there's more can i guess do you think are there more women in rehabbing than men um is it more is it a female dominated thing there's Very way much. more there's women rehabbers but there are yeah. men first too and the, the man the male rehabbers i know are wonderful They're right wonderful people. so you know women are the caretakers traditionally yeah. The right women now are, learn really quick that if when you have an infant of your own you're going to be getting up at night uh, i think we're that's right 
I think I think we're programmed early on to accept the maintenance instead of the goal. Um, a man, or even my, the vet that I work with said, hey, I'll patch them up in a heartbeat, but you take them, you feed them, you clean them, you take, and, and, and that's the, the rest of it. So something So it's the nurturing of it. Yeah, it is. And it's long-term. It's, it's yeah. women, I think, are just, we're, we're hardwired to, to know that that's the crumb bum work if you want the goal to happen of the animal to be released and on its own. Okay. But I have to say, one of the most macho men and unflappable is a rehabber. He is. <laughs> he is. And he knows yeah. the gun. And he's Warren. got a gun, too. We talking about he's Warren? got lots of guns. Yeah. <laughs> um, so somebody wants to know, was there ever a time that you were overwhelmed with too many birds at a time, you know, both inside your home or outside? And what, what do you do when that happens? Do you farm them out to other rehabbers? How do you deal with having too many birds at a time? Well, I can tell you that I wrote a book about that. <laughs> um, reha rehabber burnout is so common. It's so common because, you know, as I said, you put your limits and then you immediately go past them. And right. especially in the summertime, you have babies, you have people out who are, who are finding birds. You know, in the winter, there people aren't out so much. But in the summer, they're outside. Maybe not yeah. this summer, but they're outside. And so you can get swamped so easily. And it's a real slippery slope because, you know, there are a lot of times if you say no to the bird, there's nowhere else for them to go. That's right. And so it's it's a real juggling act. And this is why, you know, one of the things I hope Unflappable will do is is introduce people who aren't necessarily into the environment to the rehabilitation community because these people you know it's such a cool thing they do and if you want to help them you know no matter where you live in the united states there's going to be a rehabber somewhere near you and if you're inspired and think wow these people are really cool or what they're doing is cool you can call them up and just say you know i'd like to help once a week or here's like 20 bucks or something you know just reach out and right. help i know somehow so, no, I was which brings me to another question, like audio, the whole Tiger King. Well, Sorry, the whole the whole Tiger King phenomenon and what happened with you know Tiger Tigers. Um, how does that play into the whole rehabbing world right now? Is there like a lot of discussion about Carol Baskin and um, you know all these tiger people? Is that I mean, I know you guys are more into the smaller animals, the birds and the whatnot, but I mean, that is, I mean, Carol Basket is a tiger rehabber, right? You know, rehabbers <laughs> rehab native species. That's yeah. the thing. That, okay. That, that's you know, important. these are just weird collectors. Right. Right, Kim, you, I mean, you you know more oh, than me. I, honestly, I haven't even seen there, it. There are lots of different personalities in rehabbers and many people come to it who are hurt and damaged with their own backgrounds and they don't like people anyway, but they love animals. And that's very understandable. And they can make wonderful rehabbers. Then there are some who do it. It's kind of like, are you doing it for spirit or are you doing it for ego? And yeah. if you go in yeah. in order to make your ego a bigger thing for yourself, then that's where you end up with a tiger king. And if you... Yeah end up in rehabbing because your spirit grows instead of your ego swells. That's kind of the difference. I hope that kind of answers. answers yeah. Good. So. Okay. And this is a question for Susie. Um, was Mars character based on a bird you rescued or alternatively, do you have a favorite rehab story to share? Um, Mars was, was not based on any bird that I rescued. Although the fact that, uh, he is a homicidal bird, <laughs> I, <laughs> I have, uh, had the, I, I've had uh, encounters with birds like that, mostly great horned owls. I, mm -hmm. when I worked at the Raptor center, there would be an enormous flight cage filled with great horned owls and, 
they would, those birds were bears. I'll tell you. I mean, if you went in to feed them, you'd have to wear a football helmet and pads and you'd have to have big gloves because they would just, they'd do a, a flyby instead of a drive-by. It was a flyby and yeah. just knock you. Scalping. <laughs> yeah. if they, if, if Scalping. They, they would off. scalp you, yeah. you know? Yeah. And now, it's do you, just, do, do you name the birds when you're rehabbing them? Um, personally, sometimes I named them and sometimes I didn't. It all depended on the bird. Sometimes the birds are so just, they're so wild and they're, they are so resentful of being confined and they don't want people to have anything to do with them. And I, I really try and be hands off. And those birds, normally I don't name them because I feel like I'm sort of saddling them with a symbol of captivity. You know, it's like yeah. red tail number 65 hates me, that kind of thing. Right. But some of them, some of them just kind of, they're so down when they come in and all their defenses are down. And so they, they kind of accept you more and you try not to push that. But yeah. those are the birds that end up with names. <laughs> and you end up keeping any of the birds long term? Never. We don't, there are, there are some places, there are rehab centers that also have uh, display birds because they're sanctuaries as well. If they have the space for that, they, you know, part of their income can be people who take tours and look at the birds that are in these big flight cages. And right. if we have a bird that's unreleasable and we can place them in a setup like that, then that's optimal, but it's, it's hard hard to find because you can imagine there there are a lot of birds that a lot of birds and mammals everything that can't be released so it's hard and and the the uh, the bird has to have a particular personality that is suitable yes. for that the ones who are super wild children and their heart is in the sky and they are miserable and angry and depressed and stressed and stressed and stressed um, I get calls all the time. We found a baby bird. What do we do? And it's get it back with its parents is the, the preferable thing. But if you can't, even so as babies, some will immediately be easy to take care of. They'll be fine. Others are terrified of you. And, and I tell folks, it's kind of like if a Tyrannosaurus tried to pick you up after you had a wreck on your bicycle, would you want them to carry you back to their cave and take care of you? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it feels to them. You have so many great analogies for everything, Kim. You really do. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I'm going to call you the queen That's of the true. analogies. Well, our hour is just about up here, and our questions have been answered, and we've had our special guests on screen. Our our, our new little baby silver tail hawk was that was that called a silver tail hawk? No, that's a red tail. Oh, red tail hawk. Oh, okay. You can tell I'm not much of a birder. And then we had yeah. Ruby on. So that was great. We had a little bit of birds on screen. We had some questions. We had a lot of great conversation. We found out all about Unflappable, which is if you click the little button on your screen, you can it'll take you right to Susie's page where it's available to get ordered. But I also encourage yeah. you to check out Wing It, um, which um, Kim is still very involved in. I know like right now, Susie's just had a move and she's taken a step back from rehabbing for a little bit, but um, Kim is still very involved in Wing It, so you can go check out all her activities there. And we can look out for other future books from everybody here. And I want to thank yeah. both uh, Susie and Kim for giving up their time to come share their experience with us, talk about their books and their lives, and to certainly teach me a lot more about um, rehabbing than I ever knew. And um, it's great to learn always new things like this. And this was a wonderful discussion. So thank you both so much. Um, oh, and Geraldine says she's in the thick of reading Unflappable and loving it. And Jessica <laughs> says it was wonderful. Thank you, Susie, Kim, and Janie. Um, so I, it sounds like um, lots of great feedback oh. coming in through the chat. And um, this is going to be up for replay on Crowdcast. As soon as we log out, you can actually come in and watch it again or tell your friends to come in and watch it. And then it'll eventually it will come up on the library's YouTube channel. So thank you oh. for joining us here again tonight. Oh, we had one last question come in. Let's see. Okay. Oh, last question coming in, and then we're going to end it. Was there ever an okay. animal or bird that was too difficult to rehab 
Um, and if so, are there like specialty rehabbers that come in in a situation like this? I so, have, uh, I have a quick story. If you, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. A few years ago, I was called to the vet because a young crow had showed up, and the way it had shown up is a family was in there in about ready to fly their plane off of a small airport away from a small airport, and uh, they mm -hmm. saw the crow standing on the tarmac. And they walked over to it, and this is a young one. It still had bright blue eyes, and it jumped up on their arm. And that to me sounded like an imprinted baby, someone who had had yes. a stolen one and it was a singleton. And I got to the vet and it was there in the, the cage and I, I opened the door and it jumped up on my shoulder. Yeah. That's not how they should be acting. And for a time, I struggled with what to do with him. I called him Mongo because <laughs> Mongo liked food. And uh, I you named him figure out how to do an educational bird and he is crows are as smart as a three-year-old easily maybe a lot of adults I know they're smarter than that too and right. he lived with us for a time and uh, it was everyone who wants a pet crow it's almost like I wish I could drop the experiences on you just choom, choom, choom. it's a lot of work it's a whole lot of work and it's very unfair because they want to be entertained. They want to be out there. They want to do their own thing. And I was looking around, what do I do with this guy? He needs friends, but he's not socialized. How do I do this? And wild care, which is a rehab center here in, you know, wildlife center in Oklahoma had had a similar situation that they'd had outside with, they put, the somewhat imprinted young crow next to a couple of unreleasable adults and they had gotten to be friends and it had gotten wild enough that they were able to release it into the murderer. I don't like to call it a murder a flock of crows that, that lives on like 20 <laughs> acres behind there. And it, it, the bird integrated and they had the spare room. And I said, please, please, will you take Mongo? And they did. And he oh. became wilder and wilder with these two grown-up crows next to him. And the one that That's had been released great. started coming back and dropping presents in Mongo's cage. Hmm. And time went on, and they let Mongo go to go be with his new best friend and all the other crows out there. And I will ever be forever grateful because when you see anything that is desperately unhappy and bored and destructive and difficult and it goes on to where it ought to go nothing feels better than that and i know susie is like one and the same with me on that story it's yeah what a what what a yeah. yeah 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 well thank you that's a yeah Great story, and yes, I'm sure it's hard to find homes in, in in that kind of situation. So, thank you for all that you do to help out our um, injured and wildlife that needs rehabbing and wild. It's a really important, really important job in life, and I'm so glad that you're both here to take it on. It's been a great pleasure meeting you both, and so thank you from Princeton Public Library for joining us here tonight on Crowdcast. And we're going to say good night from here. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. <laughs> good to see you all.